Welcome uh, to the uh, to the podcast. Welcome to the show. Uh, we do have a uh, a very good one today. You know, uh, for a change with Lily. Eskelson Garcia, the president of the National Education Association, which represents millions of members, uh, teachers, counselors, uh, custodial staff, administrators, bus drivers. Um, and I, I talked to Lily earlier this week about education, about the, uh, the secretary of education, uh, Betsy DeVos, Betsy DeVos, about uh, teaching during this time of the pandemic, about uh, the terrible disparities in this country uh, that we're seeing during this time and, and what that means for our children and, and for the education they receive. I, I think you really like Lily um, almost as much as you like me. Uh, but I am recording this on, on Friday, May 29th, a few days after the murder of uh, George Floyd in my city of Minneapolis. And this has been a very uh, painful time for Minneapolis, for George's family, for everyone in the Twin Cities. When I first heard about this, when I was first told about it, I cried. Um, this is before I saw the footage, but this is so senseless. This is so much pain and anger and, and hurt. And the first thing I thought, I thought, back to the OJ trial and the moment they announced the verdict and I I was shocked about the verdict and I was watching TV and I can't remember what network it was but they're on a battered women's shelter in Chicago at the moment they announced the verdict. Now these were black women who had been subjected to violence at the hands of their husbands or their partners and they cheered. They cheered the verdict and I I could not process it right away. I, I, I thought, these are women who have been beaten up by their husbands, and they're cheering about a not guilty verdict on a man who killed his wife. But these were black women, and I realized I didn't know something. That was the moment I realized there's something basic I did not understand. Uh, I realized right then and there, that what I didn't know was the extent to which black people distrust the police and to what extent they've been brutalized by whites, by whites, and by white police. And I didn't know, and I don't know what was going through these women's heads. Did they think the police had set O.J. up? Did they know that he, he killed his wife or ex-wife, but were glad that he got away with it? Like white people have gotten away with it all these years, all these centuries. The murder of George Floyd was captured on video. The murder of Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia was captured on video. The murder of uh, Philando Castile in St. Paul was captured on video. And you wonder, you wonder, before there were cell phones with cameras, how many people of color have been routinely killed. My, my city has been burning. St. Paul has been burning. We are in the middle of a pandemic that we have no idea how long we're going to be going through it, and, and we have a collapsing economy. This week, the Census Bureau released data saying that one-third of Americans suffer from either acute anxiety or depression, and it's especially the case among people with lower income. Um, you will hear in a moment my, my conversation with Lily Eskelson Garcia, Lily, okay, Lily from now on. You'll hear a moment when I talk about all my teachers in elementary school, and I mentioned that my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Moline, was my favorite teacher. And Lily asked me why Mrs. Moline was my favorite teacher, and you'll hear me start to cry. And I really don't know why. First, I, I just want to assure everyone 
Mrs. Moline is still alive. She's still still going strong. If I were to guess why I cried, I, I, first of all, it was just that Mrs. Moline was a great teacher. She is still around. She was 27 when I was in fourth grade. So I would guess, my math is she's 87 now. Here's how I know. She told me that she was 27 <laughs> when uh, I was in fourth grade because uh, I asked her that. And my memory of her was that she was a middle-aged woman. <laughs> I was eight years old in the fourth grade, and an eight-year-old thinks, I think, that a 27-year-old woman is, is well on <laughs> in her years or something. So uh, the reason I cried, I think, uh, first of all, that she was the big reason I won. She wrote me a letter when I, I started to run for the Senate. I had not heard from her. I, I think I saw her at the state fair once. That, that, actually, that's true. In 2007, she wrote me and she said, if you were the Alan Franken I taught in fourth grade at Cedar Manor, then I think you'd be a great senator. And she sent me a check for 25 bucks. So I hadn't seen her since I left Cedar Manor after the sixth grade. And I asked her, once I got the letter, to come to a coffee that we were having at somebody's house. And she came, and I remembered right away why she was my favorite teacher. She was just so energetic and so loving to all of us. And we hit it off, of course. I hadn't seen her or talked to her in a long while. And a few weeks later, I asked her to star in my first TV commercial. So I'm going to play a little, little of that commercial. It was my first ad uh, of my Senate campaign. I think you'll enjoy it. So I read about this man running for U.S. Senate, and I thought, that's the Alan Franken I taught in St. Louis Park. I got this letter from Mrs. Moline. She wanted to help with the campaign, so I asked her to be in a TV ad. A TV ad? Okay, here we go. Alan was a hard worker, and he went on to graduate from Harvard. He was funny, too. I guess that's why he became a comedian. I was really more of a satirist. Okay, Alan. You see, he's also written six books and hosted a radio show on public policy. He's been married to Franny for 32 years, and they have two grown kids. And you know, he's visited our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan four times. In the Senate, he'll work to make college affordable, fight for universal health care and end the war in Iraq. Thanks, Mrs. Moline. You're welcome, Alan. I'm Al Lynn Franken, and I approve this message because I'm serious about fighting for Minnesota families. Okay, so I played all of it. Um, but this was a killer ad. Uh, the ad shot me to the top of the Democratic field, and, and uh, I never looked back, and it really helped me against Norm Coleman. Norm Coleman grew up in, in Brooklyn. As I said, I was the only New York Jew in the race who grew up in Minnesota. And it sort of proved it. Also, I won the race by 312 votes, and Mrs. Moline was one of 17 children. So I think it was her family just put me over. Now, she was one of 17 kids, and so I was curious. I said, uh, how did they turn out? How did... Of the 17 kids, how did they turn out? And he said, it was about 50-50. <laughs> so why did I cry when, when Lily asked me why she was my favorite teacher? Well, I, I think uh, it's because I'm an American going through this time, going through my version of what everyone else is, is going through and also because when I thought about it, Mrs. Moline, and I've talked to her a lot since this happened, I know that she was heartbroken by what happened to me two and a half years ago. So, uh, today is about education, it's about teachers, uh, it's about our kids. And um, I, I, it's, it's a really, really good one, you know, for a change. With me today, I'm so pleased to have Lily Eskelson Garcia, who's the president of the National Education Association. I was on the uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Lily, welcome. 
I am so happy to be here. And you know, uh, you were our extra special hero uh, teachers um, on that committee because you kind of read the riot act to Betsy DeVos during her nomination. We just loved the way you pinned down her ability to embarrass herself. It was joyful. There's a story behind that. She, Betsy DeVos, of course, our uh, Secretary of Education, we knew she was a, a, just a terrible choice. She's done nothing, right, to uh, change anybody's mind about her. No, I would say she's done a lot of things to cement all of our doubts we had about her being good for children or other living things, and so now we, we know. Yeah, kind of a, I mean, I hate to say she's a horrible person, but... Look, she she had no experience in 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 education, in public education, certainly. I asked her a question about uh, her views on proficiency versus growth. It's because I knew that she didn't know what that was at all. And I would like your your views on uh, the relative advantage of profi- measuring, uh, doing assessments and using them to measure proficiency or to measure, measure growth? Well, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I think if, if I'm understanding your question correctly around proficiency, I would, I would also um, correlate it to competency and mastery so that you, each student is measured according to the um, advancement that they're making in each subject area. Well, that's growth. A, at, at, that's not proficiency. So in other words, the growth they're making is in growth. The proficiency is if an arbitrary reached, if standard. If reached a level, the proficiency is if they've reached a, a like third grade level for reading, et cetera. Is no, I'm talking about the debate between proficiency and growth and yes. what, what your thoughts are on them. But, you know, you could have asked her a whole lot of questions and she wouldn't have known those either. Yeah, but, but, but proficiency versus growth was the debate in, in school accountability. How, you know, how do you measure whether a school is doing its job or not, which was the whole idea behind No Child Left Behind exactly. in the first place. To hold schools accountable, you had to measure their performance, and NCLB had – Put it all on proficiency. What mm-hmm. percentage of your students were at their grade level of proficiency in math and, and reading? But growth was a different measure, which is how much is each kid growing in his or her own reading level or a level in math? How much did each kid grow that year? Are the kids progressing a grade level or more or less uh, from where they started? Your point is that there is something that says, what did you get on that standardized test? And how much did you grow? You started here and you grew this much on a test and that's the growth. You know a lot of details about this, but just asking the question, proficiency or how far you grew, you'd think that even somebody who didn't know a lot of the details could figure out what that question was all about. And she just did a deer in the headlights. What are you talking about? And it's all anybody was talking about um, when you talk about tests. Yeah, uh, just for the listener, to be clear, the, the person who's going to be secretary of education should know why growth versus proficiency was the central debate in education at the time. When, when NCLB started, whether schools were considered successful or not was all based on proficiency. What percentage of your third grade students have achieved a defined third grade level of proficiency? And if a certain percentage of your kids did not reach proficiency, there were all kinds of negative and sometimes draconian consequences for the school. Well, it, it turned out that there were a couple problems with that. Uh, First of all, because these tests were so high stakes, the teachers focused their attention on on kids who were just below and just above proficiency. Exactly. And if you have a kid who was way ahead of her classmates, you could just ignore her. She's she's not going to fall below proficiency. It's just just not going to happen if you had a kid with no matter what you did, you couldn't get that student up to proficiency. You just ignored that kid. Mm -hmm. 
You put your focus on the kids just above and just below proficiency, and that was called the race to the middle. So that was a perverse effect of relying on proficiency. The other problem is that uh, different school districts are different. My, my daughter taught third grade in an area of the Bronx where the students uh, were not well off, to say the least. Now, 20 miles to the north, you have Scarsdale. Now, a sixth grade teacher in my daughter's school who would take a child who's at a third grade level of reading at the beginning of the year and gets that student to a fifth grade level that teacher is a hero. Mm-hmm. But if you're using proficiency, well, then that teacher's a failure. So there was this debate in education. You shouldn't put everything on testing, but if you're going to use testing to determine what's working and, and to hold schools accountable, then do you measure growth or proficiency in the testing? This was the basic debate in K through 12 education. And Betsy DeVos had no friggin' clue what the hell I was talking about, which was stunning. Well, and what you did, uh, Al, was you looked her right in the eye and said, you know, I'm going to ask you a question that anybody, including a whole lot of parents who are not professionals, would know about this. And she just stared. You could have asked her about something on special ed. You could have asked her about the civil right of a child to have equal access and opportunity. Girls and boys, black and white kids, transgender kids to have the right to go to the bathroom without being humiliated. That's a huge part of the Department of Education's work. It looked like it was the first time she had ever even thought about so many of these issues that you and your colleagues just peppered her with. It was our proudest moment. And this is the way I like to uh, characterize it. When she did not win Senate confirmation, because it was tied, you win when you have one more than half. And they had to have Mike Pence schlep down to the Senate and, and break the tie. But she did not win the senators. She did not win the Senate. She won because Mike Pence broke the tie. And I have to give you and your colleagues all the love in my heart for helping expose the person I think is one of the most dangerous people in the Trump cabinet. And that says something. She's hurting children every day. It's unbelievable. And you know what what Lamar Alexander did, who's chair of the committee, he said that we could only ask one round of questions, five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And we on the Democratic side said, what? What? What?" And he said, oh, that's a rule. And I go, you know, we were all going, when was that? When when was that rule establishing? He went, well, Arne Duncan and uh, John King, when they had their hearings, in the Obama administration, we only had one five-minute round of questions. Well, yeah, but Arne Duncan was head of the Chicago public school system for 12 years. And John King spent a few years as the acting deputy secretary of education and before that had uh, been in charge of New York State's educational system. And before that, it was also a graduate of, of uh, had a doctorate in education and also was a doctorate in law. Yale. And we only had to have five minutes. She knew nothing. 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 (laughs) I mean, the irony of someone in charge of education who knows nothing about education. But of course, that was the point. She doesn't believe in public education. She doesn't believe in public anything. But she really just believes that they should all be private schools, that they should all be home schools, and that public education uh, is, a, is a bad thing in a bad place. At the National Education Association, 
we poll people all the time. We poll our, our members, 3 million teachers, bus drivers, school secretaries, uh, teachers, assistants, librarians, school nurses. If you work in that public school sector, uh, you can belong to the National Education Association. And we, we want to know how the public feels too. Republicans and Democrats alike see her for what she is. Uh, people who like Donald Trump don't like Betsy DeVos. Um, and I, I know it's because she is so obviously unqualified, unprepared, and has no interest in doing anything except corrupt education programs that were developed to help our most vulnerable, marginalized students, and to take that money and to give it to private schools. She doesn't even try and disguise it. And folks actually do like their public schools. Let, let's do something positive <laughs> because uh, to get the Betsy DeVos taste out of my mouth. That will, that will be nice. Blah, blah. Okay. When I started running for the, the Senate in Minnesota, I got a letter with a $25 check. And it was from my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Maloney. Oh. Yes. And she wrote, if you're the Al Franken, Alan Franken, if you're the Alan Franken who was in my fourth grade class at Cedar Manor, I could tell then that you'd be qualified to be a United States senator. So here's a check for 25 wow. bucks. So I looked her up and I called her up and I said, Mrs. Moline. And she goes, you remember me? And I said, yeah, you are my favorite teacher. Mm. And she went. Oh, and I said, no, no, no. I remember every one of my teachers. And I went down and I said, Mr. Knudsen was my sixth grade teacher and he was really great. Oh yeah, he was great. My uh, fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Longabout, she was terrific. You are my favorite teacher. My third grade teacher, and, and, and I won't say her name, I said, I didn't really actually like her. And Mrs. Moline said, she wasn't very nurturing. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, Miss, Mrs. Morrison was great. And, you know, and then I arrived at the school. I moved from a small town in southern Minnesota to the suburb when I was at the end of first grade. So I did. This is how much, how important they were. I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Why was the teacher your favorite teacher? Why? Why? Yeah. <sighs> I could read a letter. I do this a lot, Lily. People listen to my podcast, think I'm a mess. <laughs> you, you, you have made my day. The first ad I did, she, Mrs. Moline did my ad. And, uh, and uh, her main line was, okay, Alan. Because <laughs> she'd say he became a comedian. I said a satirist. Okay, Alan. Anyway, so here, this is the letter that... She, or this is the email that she sent to me. Dear Mrs. Moline, you were my favorite teacher. I wasn't a very good student. I had a hard time with math and your spelling tests were hard, exclamation point. But you saw that I liked art. And I remember you staying after school one day. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> we love our teachers because they love us. Yeah, but the payoff is in the letter. Okay, and your spelling tests were hard. But you saw that I liked art, and I remember you staying after school one day to paint a window with me. You made me feel special and in parentheses loved. Now, I'm a teacher, too. I teach special ed kids, and I try every day to make them feel the way you made me feel loved. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say thank you. That's the payoff. That's it. That's why we don't have to pay you much, <laughs> because that's the payoff. That's the trick we pull on you teachers. You, you, you got it. And so people actually know how much we love our kids. And so they yep. know we're not going to quit our jobs because we don't make a lot of money. We will, however, and I have talked to just too many uh, of my colleagues who quit their jobs because they felt no respect, because they felt like the system was saying, your job is to get three more points on that test score. You're a bad teacher. 
And, um, and they, they said, I can't do that to my kids. I can't be complicit in this. But let me tell you what every teacher has a story that says, this is when I knew why I do what I do. And for me, it was, it was one of those current events. And they were talking about a blood shortage in Salt Lake City. And uh, this little gal said, and you know what, Miss Eskelson, I think we should do something about it. I think we should put on a blood drive. Now, these are 12 year olds, right? So I said, well, you can't do that. You, you're too young to give blood. And she said, we could volunteer you. We could volunteer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm going, oh, hey, see your teacher's bleed. There's a So they wanted your blood. And we could get our we could get our parents and we could and I went, you know, the motivation of young children to see other people bleed, you cannot overstate that. They put on this magnificent blood drive. They made phone calls to parents. They signed people up. We did a press conference because we had it over Halloween, so it was the I volunteer blood blood drive, and we all dressed up <laughs> and I did my best vampire outfit. And so we're having this great time. We had a daycare center for all the toddlers and read them stories while their parents got stuck by needles, and we ended up at eight o'clock that night. My kids were on, they were they were like so excited. They were on the six o'clock news. It was amazing. And it was then that one of my students changed my life and put me on a different path. And he was probably the most annoying kid I ever had. I won't tell you his name either, but he was just someone where you were always rolling your eyes going, oh, please. You know, he was always whining and it was never his fault. And he came up to me and he was glowing. And he said, Mrs. Eskelson, how many lives do you think we saved today? And I am I get real emotional. So I went, you know what? I'll, I just, I forgot something. I stepped out in the hall and I just bawled like a baby because it hit me that I had never seen that look on his face before. And I had always thought of him as this whiny little kid and he had a different impression of himself. He was someone who saved lives. And he came up with that in spite of me. He saw, I'm an important person right now. I save lives. But yeah, I want to read you something. I want to read you something. Uh, this is from George Packer's June 2020 uh, Atlantic uh, Monthly article. When the virus came here, it found a country with serious underlying conditions and it exploited them ruthlessly. The chronic ills, a corrupt political class, a sclerotic bureaucracy, a heartless economy, a divided and distracted public. It took the scale and intimacy of the pandemic to expose their severity, to shock Americans with the recognition that we are in the high-risk category. We have these disparities uh, that are clearer than ever in terms of right now, kids who are in affluent neighborhoods can get homeschooled uh, through video for Zoom. Uh, there are kids who don't have internet connectivity. And I don't know why. I've, when I was in the Senate, I always fought for more broadband, more broadband. <laughs> and this is a right. It should be a right. This is like running water. This is like plumbing. It, it's indoor plumbing. And you always got that. Uh, what's the federal role in making sure that every blessed child has what he or she needs to succeed? I talked to a, a reporter once who asked me a rhetorical question because we were talking about funding for schools and what schools need. And she said, Lily, but you know, how much is enough? And I said, I can tell you exactly when it's enough. I want you to think about the best public school in your state. Drive through the McMansions because that's where they always are. Now tell me the name of the best public school in your state. And she actually gave me the name of a, of a school. And I said, now take a piece of paper and a pencil and walk through that school and write down the stuff 
and the staff they've got. They've got computers and a library and they've got a gym and they've got a, an orchestra and they've got, you know, just, and they've got a school nurse and they've got, a, you know, and they've got a librarian that's like finding a unicorn and they've got, just, just write it all down. They've got AP calculus and they've got after school programs. That's enough. I want you to take that instead of a test score and say every kid has to hit some stupid test score on a reading and a math test. And then I know if you're doing something. No, I want you to say, this is the best school. Look, they actually have the best test scores. Wow. They have the best graduation rate. Hey, look at that. They've got the highest number of kids that go on to college, like almost all of them. And you don't think that has something to do that they have orchestra and art and school council and they've got every book and they've got technology. And by the way, let's look at this. They never missed a meal. There's not a kid in that school that has to worry about uh, about getting lunch. There's not a kid in that school that ever worries that the lights are going to be turned off because their mom or dad couldn't pay the light bill. So I want you to think about what they bring into that school and what they have in that school. And you walk into every public school in this country and you say, why doesn't this public school have what that public school has? And she said, Lily, that's ridiculous. That's that that'd be nice in a in a perfect world. But you know that the way we fund public schools with property tax, you know that that's just impossible. So I said, listen to what you just what you just accepted. You just accepted as if it was a law of nature, as if it were gravity, that we have to fund our schools by property tax. Um, there's a million ways that you could, uh, that you could, in fact, in Utah, where I taught, um, it's the income tax, not the property tax. All the income tax goes to the state. They redistribute it on a per pupil basis. We have the most equalized school funding in the country. We are all equally poorly funded. So there's the adequacy part of it. But what I'm saying is that there's nothing more intentional than property or, or how you tax people and who you tax and how you collect it and how you distribute it. That's a very intentional human type plan. Well, I, I don't know about Utah, but um, for being on the on the education committee, I, I know that most states and and certainly Minnesota, local property tax is the way we fund almost half of our K through twelve school budgets, and the rest is almost all uh, state tax. There is some federal. There's Title One, uh, IDEA, which is uh, special ed, uh, but but that is the federal piece is relatively small. We have never had in this country ever from colonial times from pre-colonial times we have never had any education system designed to serve all children not in the segregated south not urban and rural i believe it's by design i actually believe that i believe property tax serves a certain class of people, and they say, our kids will be fine. Those kids are not our problem. Well, you're right. Uh, no matter what people say, uh, they care most about their own kids, and they want to make sure that their kids are going to get uh, all the educational opportunities they can give them. But Paul Wellstone said, we all do better when we all do better. And those kids, those other kids are our problem. They're there are responsibility. There are opportunity. I think that uh, when you go back to George Packer and his article in The Atlantic about the weaknesses that have been uh, exposed by this pandemic, you see, first and foremost, the tremendous disparities in income and wealth in this country. And we see which kids don't have broadband and are not getting enough to eat every day and don't have the same educational opportunities that affluent kids have. Nobody says, let's sit down and design something. And we don't have a national system, but let's say even in a state, let's design something where our goal is that every single child 
will be well educated, will have equal access and opportunity. They, they do that in other countries. Uh, take Norway. I'll tell you why. This, I, I talked to the uh, ambassador to the United States from Norway, uh, was in Minnesota a couple months ago, and I started asking him questions. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, in Norway, uh, the parents have a year of leave, parent leave. But it, it's less if both of you don't take it. So you can split it up, but no one can take more than nine months. So that incentivizes both parents to take parental leave. Then at, when the kids won, they have child care, which is teachers who are trained in early childhood development, and they do that till they're six. They don't have kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And then they have first grade. So Norway is really good. And it does have oil. I'm a big believer in parental leave in in the very um, important infant years of that child. And I do know the difference between the kids I taught in the suburbs and the kids that I taught at the homeless shelter and the access that they had to parents. These are overworked, underpaid um, parents. And, And in the shelter, there's all kinds of other issues, domestic violence, drug abuse. Adverse childhood experiences. This is what these kids grew up with. And there was absolutely, you know, for, for so many of these families, they're just trying to hold it all together. So let's talk about that, about adverse childhood experiences. Uh, Paul Tuff wrote this book, How Children Succeed, mm-hmm. a very influential book. Adverse childhood experiences are a parent who has drug addiction, you know, a home where there's domestic violence, extreme poverty, hunger, having a sibling who gets killed, uh, all these kind of things. And one piles up on the other, it's, it, it affects your brain chemistry. And so we have kids who are coming to school that we need, we, we really need uh, their whole life to be enveloped by our society in terms of uh, we need mental health people in schools. We just have problems that we do not address. For various reasons, I, I have some opinions about that because I did teach those children, but I also adopted one of those children and uh, who is an adult right now. We adopted him when he was four and had uh, at least half the things you just mentioned on that list. Parents uh, uh, in in and out of drug rehab, in and out of prison, no stability whatsoever, in and out of foster care. And so, uh, you know, just being kind of jerked around, we adopted him when he was four. And I just remember that was my last uh, arrogant moment going, I'm such a good teacher. This is going to work out just fine. And folks going, well, now that he's in a, in a lovely home and with two parents and, uh, has his own room and all this security. Now, everything will be just fine. And it wasn't, it wasn't just fine. I could write a book about, uh, what it's like to be, um, the mother of a, a child who, um, who did go through, uh, just severe, severe trauma. Smart, smart, smart as a whip, and will never trust another human being because of what um, happened to him before we met him. Uh, but we, uh, my husband, my late husband, and I uh, spent much of our lives visiting him behind bars, and uh, much of his adult life. Uh, behind bars. And now he's doing very well. And when people say, we're all, that's all. I went, no, this is lifelong. He's holding it together. I saw these kids at the shelter. You don't end up at the shelter just because your parent loses a job. Um, Usually it's because you have no safety net. A lot of people lose their jobs and they go back home and live in their parents' basement. You don't have a parent with with the basement. You don't have a parent. You are one paycheck away from disaster. You have a mental health issue. You're living with grandma or grandpa. Dad is is following mom uh, and trying to beat her up. Uh, there's a drug dealer looking for you. There's a loan shark looking for you. There, these these lives are full of fear. 
And the kids don't actually always know what's going on, but they know that their parents are afraid and running and that they've been abandoned time and time again. And it never, ever leaves you. Who are the first people that are going to be laid off when we hit this funding cliff that the states are all going to hit at the same time? They have not been collecting income taxes. People have lost their jobs. Sales taxes, nobody's buying anything. No one's going on vacation at all the, in Disneyland and Hawaii. Well, McConnell wants them all to go bankrupt, all, every, the state. Those states are going to lay off because they won't have the money to pay the school psychologist, the counselor, the school nurse, the the folks that are are usually the first line support in what you properly call the mental health professionals in that school. The kids that I'm talking about, their parents don't go out and find a psychologist or a psychiatrist for these kids that are acting out and are, are, are just so fragile mentally. If they don't get that service in a public school, they don't get it. And they will be the first ones let go. And and we won't we won't have the help that these kids are going to need. I mentioned like the most severe cases. I want to talk about just a regular old third grader sitting at home right now with mom and dad working from their laptop going, why are we wearing masks? Why can't I go to the movies? Someone said people are dying. They're afraid. They know something's wrong. Why aren't I in school? Is my teacher okay? Every one of those kids is going to come back sooner or later and things are going to be different. Things are going to be different because they're going to look around going, I thought I had some security. And then people told me not to come to school for two or three months. And they'll be afraid under the best circumstances. The kids that live on the edge will have a hard, hard time. And it comes out in depression. It comes out in anger. Uh, It comes out and curling into the fetal position and not wanting to participate because you don't know what's coming next. And the teachers of America are going to have to gear up just like we had to gear up to become distance learning teachers overnight. And we're going to actually have to pick up the ball uh, that is falling on our students right now and their mental health, the trauma that they're going to bring into that classroom. Well, by the way, while we're all dealing with our own trauma, Al, you just had you just had tears in your, I'm going to think eyes, but I know I heard tears in your voice and you heard mine. We are all living through this emotional time. I cry three times a day and I'm a tough little union goon. And, and it doesn't take much to get me to get tears in my eyes. And I, I, re- I was, I was welcoming people on a zoom call saying, so glad to see you. I can't believe we're, and I started to cry because we're all experiencing trauma. It's the unknown. It's the uncertainty. It's, we thought we were safe and we're not. Yeah. We're not actually sure when kids will be able to get back to school. And, and we don't know how this, you know, incredibly strange and difficult limbo is going to play out in, in in terms of everybody's mental and emotional health and and resilience, but we don't know when that's going to be. And in the meantime, we have to find ways to keep ourselves sane. You know, I appreciate all of the funny memes and the funny songs, and you know, because I need that. I need to laugh. Uh, I, I have I have never appreciated comics more. I think parents have never appreciated teachers more. Aren't comedians great? I mean, you have to admit that that comedians are a gift. I need to laugh because it's scary. It's a scary time. I need something to distract me about something I cannot do anything about. And these kids are going to come back and is going to be impacted by going through this. It, it, when, when it happens to kids and we think, oh, they were too young. They didn't know that. People told me that about my son. Oh, he's only four. He's not going to remember. All, oh, he doesn't remember it. But he was impacted by it. It, it does scar you. We're going to bounce back. I actually 
called a, a retired teacher who said, you know, they've called me back to kind of help with some distance learning things. And, and uh, you know, so I'm calling kids and I'm checking up on them. I'm helping put together homework packets. And she broke down and cried in, in the middle of telling me, you know, like how, how fun this was and how getting back in the saddle. And, and, she, and she goes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I went, stop apologizing. I said, I have stopped apologizing for, for getting tears in my eyes, for, for getting a little emotional. We are all going through some level of trauma and it's mine comes out in liquid form. Unfortunately, for some people, it comes out in anger or it comes out in depression and you don't want to get out of bed. Yeah, for McConnell, it comes out in he just gets a surge of feeling powerful, I guess. When the majority leader of the Senate says, you know what, the states uh, should go bankrupt and local governments should go bankrupt. What an incredibly asinine thing to articulate. Because by the way, he's talking about 50 states, right? What, 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 what does he think the national economy is made of? Well, the United States can't go bankrupt because we're the default currency of the world. But the states sure can. And what happens if the states and communities go bankrupt? Well, they're the ones who are funding the schools. They're the ones who are funding mental health in their communities. It's un unbelievable that this guy actually said that. And, and this is after giving $170 billion to real estate investors so that they can can deduct higher supposed losses. <sighs> so and and so this is uh, go ahead. I, I, go ahead. I, yeah, because it, it is one of those things we could just tag team on being outraged here. So let's do education. Let's do some more education, even though uh, this is educational. <laughs> okay, okay. We want to get funding equalized for every child. Is that right? Okay, that was one thing. We but, said. But let's not just say equalized. Equity means you get what you need. And it means that these kids might not need a school breakfast program. And these kids absolutely need a school breakfast program. Uh, you get what you need. And um, I would not take one thing away from those affluent families in the McMansions that said, I want AP everything for my kids. I want the technology. I want a counselor. I want everything. Um, I wouldn't take one thing away. They're very smart parents. They know exactly what their kids need to qualify to get into a university. Give me a couple of hover parents. Uh, that's a great problem to have, that these parents won't leave me alone. That's a great problem. I've experienced that. And I've experienced uh, these parents won't respond to me. And most of the time they're going through their own stuff and they're trying to hold it together. So I don't judge those parents. I just know it's a lot harder to help those kids when I don't have a partner at home uh, to, to help. So we can make sure course. kids get what they need. And it would flip what we do on its head right now. Because what we do is the kids who have the most get the most. And the kids who have the least have to have a bake sale to buy a textbook. And that's not the way it should be. Well, you know, affluent schools have bake sales, too, uh, mainly scones and, and croissants. Uh, I do know that when I went to go visit one of these high schools in, uh, in a very, very rich neighborhood, the principal was giving me a tour and apologized, saying, usually when we have guests, we have our orchestra, you know, perform for them because we, we're an award-winning orchestra, but they're not here because they are on a field trip in Paris. <laughs> Uh, we, we held a, and it wasn't a bake sale. It's like the parents did the fundraiser for that. And I don't want people to be mad at the parents at this school. No, no, it's, that's, it's a great experience uh, for the kids. And, and it gives uh, the French an opportunity to meet um, affluent American kids. For me, coming from my experience in, you know, a working class neighborhood and actually at a homeless shelter, and then to hear uh, that. But uh, it's the same thing 
where when I think of the best public school in the state of Utah, I go to Park City, where they have the Sundance Film Festival, and you've got ski resorts, and half of these beautiful McMansions are empty, because they're somebody's third home, and they're, they, they're only there for the ski season. And by the way, those aren't McMansions. Those are mansions. <laughs> No Mac there. You're right. You are so right. I'm, uh, you know, come on. The, the inequality of this country and, and, and what it means. It, it, you could probably deal with the financial inequality if you said, no matter how poor you are, you can go to the doctor. No matter how poor you are, your kid gets a great public education. No matter how poor you are, you'll be able to eat and keep a roof over your head. Um, but we don't do that. Okay, look, that's asking a lot. Okay. And let's be realistic. You know, capitalism created this country. That's where you got you. That's why we're the greatest country in the world, except for now. <laughs> except for except for the way we've done this. But, and then part of that, I will say that the president uh, kind of dropped the ball uh, for a couple months there. Kind of? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, Lily, thank you. This has been really fun. I really appreciate uh, you wanting to talk to a teacher. Um, and I really appreciate what you did for our students when you uh, served your country in the Senate. You're one of the good guys. Well, uh, thanks for that. I think so. I think I'm proud of my uh, my time there. Uh, let's uh, let's hope we're all back in school. Yeah, uh, in the fall. I hope I if hope. it's safe. I don't want anyone to uh, to put kids in an unsafe situation. So I want to I want us to listen to the doctors and the infectious disease scientists, and let's go back to school when it's safe. Well, uh, I think most Americans agree with you. Uh, the governor of Georgia, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. All right. Well, stay safe. And you be well. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.